Hi, everyone. I'm Sandra Merglio, the executive producer of Bloomberg TV in Canada. And we're going to be talking about decarbonization strategies, carbon capture, carbon storage, CCS, as they say, uh, and sustainable fuel and where we are today and what needs to be done to reach our goals of 2030 and beyond. And joining me today is uh, Mike Belenke, President and CEO of Advantage uh, Energy and Entropy, and Marcel Tunisin, Chief Financial Officer of Parkland. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for joining me today. And um, I'm going to get straight to it since there's so much to discuss today. Uh, Mike, I want to start with you. Where do you see the biggest gap in Canada versus globally? Um, uh, specifically in your industry in terms of decarbonization goals, you know, and CCS. Sure. Thanks. And thanks for having me uh, on the panel today. I'm glad to be a part of this. Uh, in terms of challenges for energy and CCS, uh, I'd probably would focus my answer on just on the entropy business, uh, which is, of course, pure CCS, so carbon negative. Uh, there's lots of stuff on the energy side, which we could go down the rabbit hole on, but I think that... Uh, uh, t for today's purposes, CCS is probably the most uh, applicable answer. And that really is uh, in Canada that there's a, a sense that carbon capture is the most direct and fastest way to decarbonize, uh, where there's no other replacement that's feasible to scale up of size. And, and so what, um, what's happened in Canada, and we've seen this in the States in a different way, is policy is evolving first before you see mass adoption of CCS. I think once the policies are in place, you'll see more investment coming more quickly. Uh, and the policies, uh, of course, in Canada were probably at the forefront globally, uh, with the exception of just in the last three weeks where the United States leaped progress with the IRA at $85 a ton. So I think that policy drives this, these things for us. And behind that, well, all, the, uh, all the technology and all the developers should flood in behind, and, and that should happen quickly. Okay. Uh, Marcel, you're focused on sustainable fuel, um, electric vehicles, and charges. What specifically in your industry where, where specifically in your industry do you see that gap? Yeah, so if you look at our business, we are a downstream player in marketing and we have one refinery. Um, and if you think of carbon emissions, of course, uh, we know that only 15% or so come out of the you know, production and refining of, uh, of, uh, of fuels, and that the majority of that emission actually comes from the consumer and using that. So we're very focused on that. Uh, and you already mentioned that we focus on electric vehicles, which is primarily in the near term a solution for retail customers that use gasoline. And so, you know, investing in EV chargers and all that and making sure that the power supply of that gets greener. Uh, so that's one part. But for commercial customers and for airlines, that is not a solution in the near term. And so there we're working on renewable fuels, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, so particularly renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and we're investing in that. Now, a couple of things. I think regulatory-wise, we see a big discrepancy in Canada between the provinces in terms of EV adoption. Those governments that actually subsidize it, they actually see good penetration, but where there's no subsidy, you don't see it. Uh, and that seems to be the primary thing. I think the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure will follow uh, quite soon after that, and that's good progress. Then on the renewable diesel um, uh, manufacturing particularly, uh, and, and Mike was already referring to that with the, uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, a lot has changed recently. Uh, and it's important for Canada to kind of, you know, see itself as part of the North American market. And these, uh, there needs to be a level playing field for Canadian projects to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike, let's go back to you. Uh, what creative decarbonization strategies would you like to see the government and industries implement? I know you talked about, you know, having stable policies, first of all. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So one thing that we're often concerned about is the application of different colors uh, to identify different products that are desirable versus non-desirable. Or for, you know, in, in, in more explicit terms, if it's fossil related, it's bad. If it's renewable, it's good. These things are not really uh, quantitative advantages. They're simply brands. Uh, so policy and really uh, capital deployment should go towards highest bang for your buck. At a time like, ne like now, where we're seeing uh, not just the war in Ukraine and, of course, the energy crisis in Europe, but inflation uh, globally, these things are becoming meaningful and real, and everything we spend money on feeds that inflation. So, uh, so as, as it relates to smart policy and smart application of technology to decarbonizing, it should be dollars per ton. And that's really what it comes down to, uh, the highest uh, bang for your buck. We love to see all carbon priced similarly. Mm -hmm. as much as possible 
and allow the market to figure out how to do that most uh, most efficiently. Uh, and and so rather than having different policies for different technologies that that um, might result in some demonstration projects, but not mass adoption of a real uh, sea change for carbon uh, reduction. Hmm. And Marcel, do you agree with that? What would you like to see in your industry? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And as I already said earlier, kind of alignment between Canada and the US and then of course stability of the framework, that's pretty critical. Uh, and we have seen both in the US and Canada a bit of shifting uh, over time and that makes kind of doing big uh, capital investment projects like a renewable diesel plant makes it a bit harder. I think we're quite fortunate. We have good support from the BC government, from uh, also the federal government to proceed with this project uh, and to get to get going uh, with that. So we, we feel quite fortunate with that. But of course, as legislation changes, whether that's in the US or in Canada, I think it's always important that we uh, recalibrate and continue to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And we did mention the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, and that $85 per ton, um, which also you know, qualifies smaller companies and smaller projects to uh, qualify them for these subsidies, which you know, inevitably opens up the market for companies to invest in green technology. Um, does it make sense for Canada to implement something similar? And what headwinds could we see if, you know, if, if Canada does that? Or for Canada to do that? Oh, Mike, and, why don't you go first? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to take that first. Uh, this is something so I, I actually smile because I'm, I'm starting to feel like I'm repeating myself too frequently uh, in other uh, discussions as well. But really, Entropy is a decarbonizing company pure play, all we do is create negative carbon emissions. Uh, and we go place to place looking for the best projects where we can apply capital, bring that capital to the table and create carbon negativity by taking carbon from what would be in the atmosphere and otherwise putting that into a geological uh, permanent uh, grave. So that, so, you know, if we think about entropy as a, as a entity that, that can transcend um, national boundaries or provincial boundaries and go for the highest value, then we will certainly go to the area that has the best policy. And right now, the IRA has created a, a better uh, incentive environment to actually go out there and invest in decarbonizing opportunities with a guaranteed revenue stream, really. So if you think about carbon credits as a derivative of carbon, what we need is the, the, the lowest risk derivative value stream. So a 12-year value stream at $85 a ton is something that you can bank against. It's a promise to pay from the federal government to the United States. What could be lower risk? Uh, whereas in Canada, that what we have is a carbon tax that we're trying to abate. So it's actually a derivative of a tax. Uh, and, and that derivative is entirely subject to political will. So with political will shifting, there is a risk that carbon price could vary. It could go up, it could, down, it could go down, it could go away. So when you think about carbon taxes, these are great tools to disincent emissions or, or consumption, you could say. But it's a very weak tool or, or you know, a, a very, very poor tour, tool to incent infrastructure style investment. These, these projects require hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, and they have a decade long payout window. If, if a uh, government policy changes or a tax policy changes during that time, that makes your investment uh, irrelevant. It, you could stand to lose everything uh, just simply on the stroke of a pen uh, in Ottawa. So these things are important. And certainly what, what I would say is up till three weeks ago, we saw Alberta as being a superior carbon market, Alberta for, for CCS. And more recently, uh, with the IRA, we think now the best place to invest is really in the States. Okay. And what, so what kind of um, sustainable financing ideas would you like to see in, in that case for, to make Canada, you know, uh, level level Canada back up on the playing field? Yeah, and, and that goes back to uh, how we chose the, the path we've taken with an ITC that funds half of every project, a cashback mm -hmm. funding. It's a great start. And it de-risks, it shortens the payout period uh, for an infrastructure style investment like that. But uh, if you have to, just have to spend, so instead, of, instead of spending a billion dollars on a project, now you have to spend a half a billion dollars on a project. That half billion dollars is still at risk through that period of time. So the company that makes that investment has to have that tolerance for risk. Most infrastructure investors do not have that type of tolerance for risk. So we think in Canada, we do require a contract for differences structure or the term that I like to use is a carbon purchase agreement structure. I use CPA, Carbon Purchase Agreement, because it's a tool, it reflects the, the, the power purchase agreement structure, which everyone really understands quite well, before you can build a, a well-financed project uh, in power, you usually need a PPA uh, with, a, with a guaranteed income stream. So that structure is uh, an advantage. 
We think that's going to come out of the Feds at some point. It's not a, it's not an increased subsidy level so much as a reduction of uncertainty in the future, where it's a contracted offtake of carbon negativity. And assuming that the Feds get there on that tool, then Alberta, Canada should be back on par with uh, the, the Canadian uh, investment um, sort of incentives. And Marcel, oh, I want to bring you back into this conversation. Um, you know, do you agree with that? What would you like to see in terms of, you know, um, uh, fi sub uh, sustainable financing ideas? Yeah, no, I think what's interesting, if you look at the um, Inflation Reduction Act in the US, and that has just come out recently, but on our side on renewable fuels, what's been uh, interesting is that the blender's tax, tax credit is really moved to a produ producer's tax credit. Uh, and that means that Canadians that want to export uh, renewable diesel into the US are no longer eligible uh, as they were perhaps before. Um, and so that is one issue if you have an export uh, based plant. And of course, you know, if you kind of take uh, renewable diesel that mostly comes in Canada out of canola, that has an implication for the upstream investments there as well, whether those are uh, agricultural or crushers and all of that. So I think that that, that that element of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is actually quite an interesting one uh, as well. Now, on the flip side of that, uh, for U.S. producers, given the legislation, and again, it's about uh, you know quite technical in the detail of carbon intensity, you find also that U.S. producers are not as likely to, uh, over the long term, to export to Canada. But in the near term, there's been uh, there's been a creation of more certainty around the benefits that are actually available. Uh, Canada has chosen a different way, and we benefit from that. There is an upfront uh, co-investment or subsidy on the investment. But as Mike said, there's still money at risk, uh, ultimately. Um, and I remind people that ultimately we invest in stability of regulation, because making renewable fuel is more expensive than making traditional fuel. Uh, but the benefit is it comes with a credit that, we, uh, that fits within an overall low-carbon fuel standard. And again, if you see a change in, uh, in, in regulation, a change in government, suddenly that can all change. Now, we don't expect that it will change. I think there's good public support to go down that route. But when we look at our customers, for instance, we look at airlines that are supposed to be customers, or they are the customers for sustainable aviation fuel, they are also all waiting for the government to somehow put a framework around it because they don't want to be the only one buying jet fuel that's probably about three, four, five times the price of traditional jet fuel and being the only one that have to actually do purchase it. Or even the airports that say, hey, listen, but if I buy it and then airlines decide to fly somewhere else because my uh, you know my airport is no longer competitive so that that framework of legislation needs to be available throughout and so we then talk about the financing framework we we focus very much on the manufacturing and we got in there and that's really good but it kind of extends into up and down the the, the value chain where everybody takes risks in kind of changing it up and it's a societal kind of challenge ultimately uh, it's not to individual businesses and this is where of course governments play an important role kind of bring an entire end-to-end -end value chain uh you know uh, with them on that route okay and um you know one of you you did mention one of the challenges specifically i mean especially in your industry is reducing the scope three emissions that is you know the emissions by the customer um what do you think it would take um you know to reduce this 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 the scope three emissions yeah so technically what it really means is if on the on the kind of the consumer side of it that is really electrification uh, in the first instance and then of course greening out the electricity not all electricity in canada is, uh, is uh, created equally in terms of carbon emission but once you get it away from the tailpipe it becomes easier to decarbonize further upstream and i think incentives for car purchases which are still quite a lot a bit higher for people uh, is an important part to kind of get going on that consumer end I think if you talk to our commercial customers, they all, the big customers, they all have, so industrial customers, airlines, uh, shipping companies, they own have their own uh, kind of, uh, you know, net zero kind of ambitions and, and targets which they want to achieve. But they also want to make sure that if they do it, that they're not the only one doing it in the industry because, you know, customers ultimately buy the cheapest product. And so if you have a more expensive input factor, uh, you, it makes you less competitive. So what we hear a lot from customers is like, as long as the framework is equal, then we can ultimately pass the extra cost on to the customer. And, and then once the industry scales up, probably the costs are coming down uh, and we might up in a much better position. So it's all about how do you kind of get going uh, on this journey? And I think kind of, um, you know, kind of having a level playing field, not just in Canada, but particularly with the US is pretty critical. And long-term versus short-term, right? Yeah. Um, what 
challenges, uh, and this is to, to both of you, what challenges uh, does your company face towards your, uh, your current climate goals? Um, Mike, let me start with you. Sure, and maybe I'll answer on both Vantage and on Entropy. Uh, Advantage, of course, is a mid-sized uh, gas-weighted producer, very low carbon intensity for energy. So one of the things that Advantage faces is some complex dynamics where uh, Paris does have, the Paris tree has some very um, huge loopholes. Uh, so for example, where an energy producer, if their end product is more than 40%, uh, you know, third party or, or, or scope three emissions, you have to account for those emissions yourself. Well, that actually creates a huge loophole for uh, the non uh, Paris uh, members to actually try and fill uh, that, and that would be coal. That'll be coal that fills that in. And so, mm -hmm. as you think about eliminating a gigajoule of energy from natural gas and replacing that with a gigajoule of energy from coal, you're tripling your emissions two and a half to three times the emissions. So, the world loses in that situation. And so, we do need to have uh, some of the loopholes that are in current climate policies and frameworks plugged or, or expanded. I think that a good way to think about that is that we should probably introduce. Scope 4 emissions, which is, uh, of course, a nascent concept. Most people haven't heard of it yet, but Scope 4 emissions are really a reflection of the good that your emissions also offset with. Mm -hmm. So if gas and replaces... Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so no, if gas would replace coal, uh, then you get credit for the reduced emissions from the gas versus coal wind. So so that, that that's probably the piece we think about most on the traditional energy business, advantage energy. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, frankly, and how are you planning uh, to tackle that? Uh, it, well, of course, this is something that a mid-sized energy producer in Canada is unlikely to be able to shift, but we do focus on, you know, number one, we focus on being very low emissions. And, and so that creates a market advantage versus other supply. You know, then it's as yeah. simple as that. This is supposed to be a competitive game where we all are striving for uh, the best product. And the best product here is low cost and, and secure and, of course, uh, low emissions. So that's the, that's the way we tackle that with an advantage. And we think we're winning. Frankly, I think the Canadian and American energy companies are much, much better than than um, other suppliers, including Russia, for example, <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to emissions, security, and and uh, affordability. So that's the that's the piece on the conventional energy uh, business, uh, and we think we'll win that long term simply because it's a better product. Uh, on the carbon capture business, because we've created a business that is just one part of the chain, and that chain is entirely carbon negative. Our scope one, two, and three emissions are entirely carbon negative. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our, our goal there is simply to grow the business as quickly as possible. And, and so that, that, um, it seems as though there's a great deal of, uh, support within every type of political affiliation, at least with any pragmatic political affiliation where carbon capture is a force for good. It exists to do one thing it has to be carbon negative. Uh, and that goes back to the same initial question. Do we believe that we want less carbon in the atmosphere or not? And if it's yeah. just simply a matter of getting less carbon in the atmosphere, let's put money to work, make the markets fair, and allow those that are the lowest cost structure to to win that game. Uh, okay. And we think that that's um, uh, you know the, the technology we have uh, within NHP is, is is putting us in a good spot to be uh, a winning party there. Okay, uh, Marcel, what about you? Uh, we barely have like a minute and a half, so <laughs> I, I apologize, but very quickly. No, lots has been said already on regulation. I think the other part is companies themselves need to do stuff. And we, we do live in interesting times, just from a macro environment and inflation. So in terms of investing in mega projects, that's of course top of mind as well. There's actual work that needs to be done uh, and the normal project uncertainty that you get. So I will mention that. I think the second, the, the second part is really around customer preference, right? And companies play a role in that. It's not only the government that makes customers switch, it's also us actually uh, you know, kind of doing our job, talking to our customers and aligning with our customers on, you know, the, the, the benefits of the of the products we think for the, the consumer. Uh, you know, we kind of invest in our retail stations to make sure that if somebody comes charging and needs to hang out there for 20 minutes, uh, that that is actually uh, better than just going to the back of an industrial zone and charging into a fast charger. So we're investing in that piece as well to attract customers. Um, and then with our commercial customers, very much the dialogue that we have, helping them to navigate, uh, you know, the, the regulatory piece uh, is an important part that we also uh, working ourselves in addition to, of course, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, talking to governments and regulators. It is a complicated space, but I think if everybody does that part, we will move forward here.